thank you very much for time shifting with us. We thought uh, getting a little further away from the holiday weekend was a good idea. I'm joined this evening by Kathy Mice. From, uh, she's the CEO of Publish. Uh, they've got a fantastic service for self-published authors, although uh, certainly I've, um, uh, tonight we won't be talking about that very much. Um, we want to make this much more about uh, marketing and social proof, and uh, Kathy's going to walk through all of that. I'm going to ask her a few questions. It was a super uh, well-received and very valuable session this morning, and I hope again to do it again tonight. Um, I want to remind everyone that we want this to be absolutely um, uh, an interactive uh, session, so throw us questions. I'll stop. I'll identify who put them up, and I'll read them uh, for Kathy and I to take a look at. Um, we're also recording this for playback later, so sometime in the next 24 hours you should get an email with a link to it. Uh, and again, uh, this is uh, I have to apologize. This is not going to be a sales pitch. We're not going to be pitching book fuel or publish. Um, uh, you can always check those things out on your own. And of course, at the end, uh, you are welcome to email me or Kathy uh, for a copy of the slides. We're happy to do that. I'll show Kathy's info in just a moment uh, when I ask her. And of course, you can also give me a call. And I'll ask Kathy, go ahead, Kathy, introduce yourself and, uh, and talk a little bit about what we're going to uh, cover tonight. Hi. Yes, thanks for having me, Bill. I'm really excited to be here and uh, meet your community. Had a really nice time with them. Great questions in the first session, so looking forward to more. Um, I am Kathy Mice, as Bill said, and I'm the founder of Bublish, which is an award-winning social marketing platform for authors. I've been in the media and publishing industry for more than 20 years, even though I'm only 20 years old. Yes, I promise that. <laughs> Um, but I started out in broadcast journalism for a CBS affiliate, um, wanted to go deeper, went to print journalism, um, ran a number of editorial brands for Forbes, and then um, I have been a freelance editor, writer, uh, nonfiction ghost writer in the business and science area for many years, so know what it means to make your living off of writing and also a founding partner of PubSmart, um, co a conference here in Charleston that was launched, and Bill was here, got to meet him in person last April, and um, speak frequently on the subjects that we're going to um, cover today, travel around, um, last gig was at BEA and you publish you. And yeah, please don't ever hesitate to uh, email me at kathy at publish.com. If you have questions, happy to help. There's a lot to learn um, in the area of marketing. And uh, that's what and, Bill and, you know, and I are going to talk about. Mm -hmm. Kathy, I have to say that that, that PubSmart Con uh, in Charleston was great. Uh, there was a lot of really valuable stuff there for self-publishing self -publishing authors. And uh, I, if I recall correctly, Hugh Howey did um, uh, he was there, um, did, did a couple of speeches, and uh, I really found it super valuable. And I would recommend anybody, if you're looking for a writer's conference to go to, uh, it's a beautiful setting. It was a great uh, time of the year to do it. Uh, you just Google PubSmartCon. I think you'd, you'd really enjoy it. Yeah, if you, you want to get uh, tied into some of their newsletters, they do a lot of thought leadership, PubSmartCon.com. And thank you. It was, uh, it was an exciting, um, you know, uh, our goal was to really build a um, a conference that spoke to authors as publishers, and you know that's kind of the goal here tonight too. You are all creatives, and you want to make money off of your books, and you know grow a, a a business and be successful. And a big part of that is marketing. So um, Bill and I are just going to talk about. Uh, a particular type of marketing um, that is really uh, has a great opportunity for authors uh, just getting started, social book marketing, um, how you can set yourself up for success um, in social marketing, and uh, the importance of building social proof to do that. That's really the, the first step. Um, and then building a community and then starting to build an author brand. Um, that can drive sales. Um, this is not a short-term tactical play. This is more of a, a look at the long-term strategy for how you will be recognized in a very 
crowded book marketplace. And then, you know, we want to talk about measuring your social marketing success so that you can become a more effective uh, marketer over time. Um, and, and Bill, you know, chime in if, if anybody has questions at any point in time, but um, I just wanted to share some data with you guys to start with. Um, this is from a man named Peter Hildick Smith who advises some of the biggest publishing companies in the world. He does a, a lot of reader data research and he, um, this is a slide that um, from his talk at Digital Book World called The Author Brand Opportunity and it's why um, I, I like to listen to hear where um, the people who are, you know, really have a lot of money to spend on marketing, where they're putting their dollars and where the people who are doing the research are telling the people uh, in publishing to put their dollars and, and what this uh, very, very well-informed and data-rich presentation basically said is there's uh, a huge opportunity for authors who are able to break through the noise and build a brand, but that there are three pillars to success as you go forth in trying to get those initial book sales. And, and one is discovery, and that's the big role of marketing. But we're also going to talk about making sure that when that discovery happens, um, and you might have someone's attention for a very short period of time, that you have the ability to um, convert them to some action that brings them closer to you, uh, your book messaging, your book brand, maybe that conversion would lead to them signing up for your email or visiting your website, um, buying one of your books. Um, but the next step of that is also availability. So when they discover you and then you intrigue them with your value proposition, your elevator pitch, whatever you want to call it about your book, um, that they immediately could say, huh, you know, um, well, I have a nook is it available on Nook, or I have a Kindle, or I have an iPad, or I read on my um, smartphone. So uh, the third pillar of initial book sales is the availability from the reader's perspective in the format that they want it. Or, you know, that may even be, I want um, a paperback version of this because I don't read digitally. So um, this very smart man has put together this great slide. I think it's something as we talk about all of these things that you need to constantly think of those three things that are in the reader's mind. So discover and then the ability to take an action based on that discovery um, to explore your brand message that we're going to talk about and then the ability to, to um, actually buy the book. Yeah, you know, I think, Abby, that uh, availability seems now for self-publishing authors to be pretty easy. I mean, I know that publishing is not just clicking a button, but, but uploading to five, six, seven sites to cover the North American market is, is, uh, is now uh, attainable for just about anybody with any quality book. And discovery is what I hear authors spend a lot of time uh, worrying about. You know what I don't hear uh, authors spend a lot of time on is this concept of, is the book idea interesting enough to buy? In other words, when I read the description, when I see the book trailer, when I hear about it described by someone else, does it grab me? Does it, is there an emotional question or tug there? And um, I'd like to, as we go further through here, I'd like to maybe touch on that a little bit because I don't think it's an area where authors give their book marketing enough thought. Mostly they spend time on the anxiety of do I have enough Twitter followers and enough Facebook likes and not so much on the once I get that awareness will people find my take on alien first contact or my uh, soup diet or you know, whatever my prescriptive nonfiction is will they find it compelling enough to buy. Yeah. Maybe that has to do with who your target, you know, maybe that comes through when you're doing your target audience research. Right, because you know, it could, even if you get that pitch down and you have a very unique way of describing uh, what we would call your value proposition, so maybe you're a thriller writer, but there are millions of thriller novels, mystery novels, literary fiction, so how do you uniquely describe your book? You've got to be describing it to someone who is interested in that genre, and like the example I give is, I have huge respect for horror writers, 
Um, it is not a genre that I read because I get scared very easily. <laughs> I don't see scary movies. I don't. So I am not your target audience. So you want to make sure that you have um, a very uh, unique way of describing the value proposition, as it were, of your book. And, and then make sure you're describing it to people and drawing the right people towards that message. So um, a lot of what we're going to talk about today are the foundations of, of um, getting to the right audience and then once you have them, you know, making sure you have the messaging right. So these are some ideas for researching your target audience. And it is very much worth your time um, to do this research. A great place to start if you are a genre writer, a lot of associations have reader data. Um, for example, the Romance Writers of America has uh, a whole page with uh, lots of statistics on how many books the romance readers, uh, uh, they have different subgenres that they talk about. They, they know the age, they know uh, how much their median income. Um, there's a lot out there through the associations and a number of the bloggers in your genre can also often share data on readers. Another great way is to actually go into those Facebook groups where readers in your genre are hanging out um, and just start talking to them and you know you'll start to find out more about what their interests are because you want to certainly be relevant in your messaging. Um, another great thing to do is to research the keywords. Um, for example, um, thriller versus mystery versus, uh, you know, you, you can basically look in a genre and, and start to see what keywords are popular on a free site called Google Trends. Um, and I think it is google.com backslash trends. Um, but just go into Google and search it. It's a free site. You can compare all kinds of keywords. So what you think readers are using as search words or search phrases, um, start there, compare them, and then once you've discovered the more popular ones, go on to a place like Twitter and put in um, the keyword there with the pound sign in front of it because in social media a lot of times these keywords are um, are uh, hashtags, and that's what a hashtag is, and it's a way of uh, categorizing things by topic or conversation. Um, the next thing is to follow reviewers in your genre and key influences um, who are targeting the same audience as you. I, I did say uh, as a, a tactical question that came up this morning, they were like, well, how would I get more readers? Well, a great way to go in is if you know someone in your genre who has, you know, 40,000 uh, followers. So go and listen in on that stream and see how that writer is talking to their audience and then click um, followers, so the people that are following this person, and choose, you know, 10 um, every day to follow yourself and start engaging with them. And they're probably the same readers who would be interested in your work. Um, again, in order to be part of that conversation in social, you need to create a lot of content. This could be anything from a tweet to a post to a blog post. Uh, on Bublish, it would be a book bubble. Um, and start see to see what resonates. Um, you know, uh, one example that we spoke about today was if you're a, a young adult or new adult writer and, you know, you're in your 50s or 60s, um, that, you know, are you, um, are you creating content that's relevant to the audience that's going to read your book? So just listen and, and start to learn. Um, and try things out and see what gets retweeted or reposted or liked or, or generates comments or conversation. Um, in marketing, it would be called A-B testing. Um, I know we got a lot of questions on that uh, this morning, and you could really do a whole session on that, but it's basically the idea that you keep um, the majority of uh, the elements the same, so maybe you would take the same content, you'd try it out on a different social network and see which network um, is more popular for your readers, or 
you would uh, change the time of day that you share the content or you might um, change the content on the same site and try to isolate with what content is resonating. And then another thing we see more and more of, and it, I think it's just fabulous, is cross-promotion with other authors. You share your findings, you, you each research different things, and you uh, kind of help each other get smarter faster through just groupthink. And um, there's just so much of that going on, and I see it done by the most popular and successful authors, because there is so much to learn. Divide and conquer, as we say. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Now, Anne's got a question for us. She says, can I make my communicating, communications page the Amazon page where most people would buy the book? Uh, though I have a website, most people will find my book on Amazon. I'd like your take on that, Kathy. My, my take is that Amazon uh, does have an Amazon author page. And yeah. I can do things on that Amazon, Amazon author page, such as uh, link my Twitter stream. I can link my blog to it. Uh, it has its own set of forums where people can come and ask questions of, to me of the, of the of, to me as the author, where I can answer them and fans can jump in too to make comments. Um, and of course, on the Amazon author page, someone can click the follow you button. So as as Amazon decides to market new stuff about you, um, uh, they'll know that that uh, they have a ready made target audience for you. So that's how I know you can do it on the Amazon author page. But I would still recommend to Anne and, and, and everyone else, I, w I would still recommend working on your own author-owned page because you own it. No one can do anything to it. You control it. What do you think, Kathy? I completely agree. Uh, buy your domain of your name because you want to build a brand around your name or get as close to it as you can. So, you know, author Kathy Mice or author Bill Van Orsdell, um, try to own that domain for so many reasons. You know, a perfect example um, is with Facebook, the way that they change their algorithms. So a lot of people use Facebook as their social hub. Well, Facebook, you know, can change the rules at any time, um, as can Amazon. Mm -hmm. And I, I also believe, you know, having the, the ownership and the ability to just, um, as you grow and, and you can invest more in your website and, and your brand evolves, you have a lot more flexibility because it's a page that, and a, a platform you're building. So it should really be the center of your hub, whereas you're always going to be constrained in these other environments by what is you know available yes be on all of them but I'm a huge believer in the importance of a website for authors yeah I, I would uh, it's it can be tough to pull off but in a perfect world you're driving interest and attention to your author anchor website and it it updates through plugins and other technical tools your social media sites and you use those social media sites as a funnel back to your author site, but wow, that's getting, you know, we're getting a little far down the road there. Um, uh, you yeah, heard the data I I, too, Bill, I would just insert that, you know, um, these platforms share only the data that they want you to have, mm -hmm. and when you have your own website, you can connect it and gather all kinds of interesting information about where people are coming from. You know, Amazon is not going to tell you that. You can, you know, build in plugins to capture emails and, and then you have that email list um, to grow your audience for the long tail market, which means, you know, we're not constrained by bookshelves anymore. Mm -hmm. so you want to have a relationship with these people for a long time and, and that does take um, having a hub that is under your control. Yep, and uh, you, we've got a question from, I, I hope I'm getting the name right, you heard it, and mm -hmm. uh, the question is, what tips do you have for young authors? Uh, my first tip would be, um, if you're a young author, especially if you're writing to the YA audience, to, to the young adult audience, uh, tap into the power of your target audience's affinity for social media by being active on social media yourself, 
And you know, back to what Kathy just said, when you build your author anchor website, you know, you are going to start asking for to, for emails to build a permission-based email list so that you can keep those potential fans and fans engaged and give them a reason to buy your book. Kathy, for a young author, what do you say? Oh yeah, I mean, you are the most connected generation in the history of mankind. So build off of that is just a gift and 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 make sure that you know you you make the people who are following you aware that you are an aspiring writer I'm not sure if you published your first book or you're writing it or it's just something you see down the future but this is all about letting people know that writing is part of your journey and sharing those stories and pulling them into that story of your writing career because uh, gosh, 20 years from now, they could be the one, you know, helping you launch your fifth book because they were there at the beginning. I mean, it, it's uh, it's great. And so, do you want? We're ready to talk about content calendar, are we, Bill? Mm-hmm. Yeah, about getting disciplined. <laughs> so, yeah, the discipline word. So um, there's a lot of similarities between being an author in this day and age and being an entrepreneur, which is why one of our favorite words at Publish is authorpreneur. Um, you are really starting a small business. Um, one of the best tools, um, it, it is su such a great fit, is content creation and content marketing. Um, but as you write your books, and authors are being asked to write more books more quickly because great books sell other books and um, enable you to make more money over time as the price of books, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure on the price of books, but you also have this gift of being a writer. And so creating promotional content and telling stories in a promotional fashion is something I do webinars on all the time. Um, it's a very powerful tool, but it takes a lot of discipline to be consistent, and that's so important. I see so many authors get started, um, and like I said this morning, it's kind of like when you decide, okay, I need to get in shape, and I'm going to be a runner now. And so you go out, and uh, you run five miles the first day, and you feel great, but the next day you can't walk, you're tired you don't have a plan to recover and you know you you push through a couple more times and then you're like oh my gosh I can't do this I'm not going to be a runner so this is what happens with promotional content a lot and social media because it is a very demanding um, in, in, in the way of content creation so we are very, very strongly advocate for content calendars and this means if you if you decide, okay, I really need to write great books, that takes a lot of time, I have one hour a day to do book promotion and social media and social marketing, all of that stuff, that you know exactly what you're going to do during that one hour because you wrote it on a calendar and you are constantly looking down the, the horizon because you know next week you've got that blog due on Wednesday, um, you're going to spend 20 minutes at noon every day, um, actually actively engaging. You're going to spend 20 minutes in the evening um, researching a new platform. Say you, you're on Twitter, but you need to learn Facebook, or you've never gone to Google Plus, or you're thinking about YouTube. You're going to do 20 minutes of research. And that is all plotted out on a calendar. And it's really all about um, making this sustainable for the long term um, and carving out um, uh, the amount of time that's reasonable within the constraints of all of us have crazy lives and then committing to that calendar and saying these are the topics I'm going to talk about or um, I'm going to share every Tuesday it's going to be visual so I'm going to take some pictures on the weekend and I'm going to share pictures on Tuesday and Thursday at 8 o'clock and there's a lot of tools um, Hootsuite came up this morning, which is a free tool that you can use to actually schedule um, this uh, some of the content, and and I am a huge believer that you know 
you want to be front of mind and you want to share interesting content, but you can't be on social media all day. So have times when you're engaging, when you're talking, when you're learning, and have other times where you have things posted and automated. And um, Hootsuite is free um, for the, 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 the basic plan and it's an extremely powerful tool and it has analytics which is going to start to show you, you know, what's resonating. And then we've already talked about the importance of the author website so I won't uh, go into that too much but uh, I think Bill and I uh, both believe very powerfully that you should own your domain and, and own the, the content that, that goes on that website so that you need that hub to draw people Absolutely. to work. And remember that, that the, the key there, uh, just to, to kind of go back to that initial um, three circles that we looked at, is that you, you want to have a website that connects the dots. So uh, this, this drives me crazy. I'll be looking, uh, uh, I won't be able to find somebody on Twitter and I want to get their Twitter handle and I go to their website and they still don't have the links there. So you should have front and center, how to follow you with one click. These are all plugins that can be put on your website very easily. How to get to any, any place I want to go to find you. Because say I hang out on Google+, that's where I want to find you. So have that connecting the dots. Make sure there, you know, there's an about you so they can learn more about you. There's a nice picture. You're a human being. Um, there's big beautiful covers of your books. If you're in the process of writing a book, you know, you should be um, sharing that with them. And if the book is for sale or for pre-order, big links, where is it available again? So that all the pieces are there. And, and finally, um, the ability to then join your, your email list um, or, or, or follow your blog or sign up for your newsletter. So that on um, WordPress, which is a very popular site, is again a plugin. And I forgot to say this this morning, Bill, but that same plugin is available on Facebook. So if you're in the process of building your website, um, you can put that MailChimp uh, uh, widget. widget, exactly, thank you, right on your Facebook page and start gathering an email list. Um, right through your Facebook page, though I still think you should also have it on your um, your website. And MailChimp is just another service. It's free for uh, up to 2,000 followers, very affordable after that, designed for small businesses, and um, very easy um, to start to capture emails, which is how you build a more intimate, long-term um, relationship with, with your fan base, that you, you can start it on social media and draw it towards uh, that longer-term relationship. Yep. Now we've had a couple questions and comments flow in. Uh, the first one's from you heard it, and she says, "Are writing clubs a good idea to join?" Um, I'm not certain if uh, if we're talking about uh, critique groups or something else, but I would say that any any group that uh, keeps you motivated to write and to keep producing output can't be all bad. What do you think, Kathy? Yeah, and again, you know, if those groups are also willing to kind of share what they're learning on the marketing side, you know, the more information you can gather from many minds, I think it just it just helps. And it, it you know, it's it can be kind of lonely and overwhelming. So as long as they're supportive and you're you're getting out of the group and giving to the group in a way that's uh, effective for you, I think it makes sense. Uh, great. We've got a comment here from Ann. She says, uh, I realize Google is supposedly good, but I find they are too much in my face and difficult to make corrections. Safari doesn't like Google and most times won't open the Google page. Uh, Ann, the only thing I would think of is maybe uh, maybe take a look at installing Chrome. That might help you interact with, uh, interact with Google. Uh, Renee Bates has a question. She says, when you write your novel, should you go ahead and get it copyrighted? I've written my first novel, but haven't taken any legal step to get it copied get it copyrighted yet. And Renee, the short answer is that as you write your novel, you are literally activating the copyright provisions of the US Constitution, assuming you're in the United States. And so your work is protected. Registering your copyright at copyright.gov gives you some additional statutory protections 
and, and, the, and then the bottom line, the recommendation, the best practice recommendation is every author should copyright their book, that is register their copyright with the U.S. government at copyright.gov within 90 days of publication. And uh, of course the reason, as I said before, there's some statutory protections, the most important of which is um, statutory damages are, I think it's 150 or $115,000 per infringement. And all that really means is you can get a contingency lawyer to take your, take your case if infringement occurs. And then, Kathy, would you add anything to that? Uh, no, I mean, uh, I would just say that there's, there, I also would suggest an ISBN. I don't know um, how you feel about that. It's not exactly uh, copyright protection, everything you said I agree with, but I also think um, it gives more validation and the ability to track, and it is then registered with the Library of Congress um, as additional protection. It also helps the entire independent universe of authors understand, because uh, I know a lot of people aren't buying ISBNs because they're expensive, but um, it helps us get statistics for this very, very large group of writers. Um, and when you don't participate in the, the tracking system, it's harder to get that data. Yep, yep. We give them away for free to, to any author that wants to work with us. Okay, Renee also says, should you do a website with only one book, or, or should you wait until you have at least three books out first? My short answer is, and I bet Kathy will expound on this, is uh, you should build your website as soon as you want to start building your author brand. And frankly, that might be before you even finished your fir first book. What do you think, Kathy? Totally agree. In fact, I just was working with a new author um, with exactly that. She's got a manuscript, but not sure when it'll be published. And uh, she was amazing within... Uh, 48 hours, she had her website up, and she was already telling her story to the world, and she had photographs, and, um, you know, there's so much technology out there to make this pretty simple from a, from a technology point of view, but the key is to draw people towards your creative journey as early as possible, um, and to start to build an audience of people who you have a commonality with and who want to support you and um, want to share your journey. That's really, in essence, what it's all about. So that journey can't start too early, in my opinion. Um, it's, that's a little different than thinking about um, how you're going to launch your book. So there are campaigns that should go along with that and starting nine months, six months before the actual launch. But the concept of having a hub for yourself and telling the world, I'm an aspiring writer, um, that journey, I think, can't start early enough. Mm -hmm. Karen Hughes has a question for us. Uh, 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 can you talk about Creative Commons and, uh, Creative Commons and content uh, and what to watch out for? So I can, Karen, I think you're talking about uh, Creative Commons licenses. So there's, I can think of two avenues to answer your question. One would be, um, what about using uh, creative content, common licensed uh, material in my books? And the other would be, what about releasing my book under a Creative Commons license? Um, I am not an expert in either, um, and I, uh, but I do, if I recall correctly, I think there are a couple of wiki pages, Wikipedia pages, that give a pretty good layman's term view of how and when you'd want to use them in both uh, directions. Do you know more about that, Kathy? Uh, I don't know a lot about the legal, but it is, to, in my opinion, one more reason to, you know, make sure that you have a, a website so you, you do have control of that domain and should anyone challenge um, your authority to write something or copy something, you have this hub to, to show that you have been uh, writing on this particular topic under this particular name. Uh, that there may be a title associated with that content, but it, there's no doubt what I've seen in my journey just as a writer myself is that there is so much more gray area than there has ever been because our content uh, is all over the place, you know? So, uh, and just, you know, be careful, like when we created our terms of service, you know, we were extremely careful and had a reporting mechanism 
at Publish, should people try to upload other people's content and pass it off as their own. Um, so, yeah, there's, you, you know, you just have to, it takes time to read the terms of service, but when you are posting content to other sites, understand how they view your rights to your content, you will sometimes be surprised. <laughs> yep. Uh, let's move on to social marketing. Yeah, so, you know, just getting started, and of course, I'm not quite sure where everyone is in their journey, but a great place to start um, on social marketing is with listening, and, and if you've started and you're frustrated or you're not growing an audience or they're not engaging with you, just go back to these basics of, you know, really listening, and again, if you can find some key influencers in your genre who are doing a great job of engaging, listen, watch, engage. There's also a lot of great, uh, if you're nervous to go ahead and get started engaging, there's lots of great chats um, on uh, Twitter. There's lots of uh, groups on um, Facebook and on Google Plus where you can go and uh, start talking just with other writers to kind of get, you know, a sense of how that all works. Um, you know, then you want to start to attract um, those types of readers, um, after you've researched them and, and you start to find out where they are, what age they are, what they talk about, you know, attracting them towards you. Um, the whole idea of relationship marketing, which is just as changed as the book marketing, I, I'm sorry, as the book industry is in this day and age, that's how much marketing has also changed. And it is very much now about relationships, giving back, growing community, so don't throw tomatoes at me, but when you get started with social marketing, the best thing to do is to not think about selling books. Just in the very beginning, just don't think about the outcome of selling books. Just think about if you, if you went into a cocktail party, you would never say to someone, buy my book, it's on sale for 99 cents or whatever. That's just not how, how you talk to people. So the same thing with social marketing. Just be a human being, connect, attract, and, you know, if you're attracting the right people, at a certain point, they will start to support you if you've drawn them into your story correctly. But it's not, it's not going to be successful if you're going to be seen as a spammer, because ultimately, if you're talking about price and you're talking about sales all the time, um, there is a place for it, but if that's your message, then that becomes your brand message, and it's really nothing that's going to distinguish you in this very, very crowded marketplace. So be yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so social proof. Yeah, so this is probably, um, you know, there's so much opportunity in social, but this is the very beginning, and, you know, put yourself either in the shoes of a reader or someone who doesn't know you. Or when you're approaching someone else, just think always, okay, well, is this person, you know, someone, I, I, who are they? You know, what do they do? Do we have common interests? Do we have common beliefs? You know, is there anything inspiring about this person? Am I interested in spending any time? You know, why do you follow other people? What do they do that inspires you to follow them? So you need to prove that to strangers. Um, and it's all about building trust, and that's why it matters, because when you move social proof to the concept of marketing, you're basically saying, I'm a real person. I have a why. Here's why I write. This, these are my passions. These are my interests. You're going to attract a lot of people who share those common interests. And then, you know, at a certain point, they're going to trust you. And then you'll say, hey, sign up for my newsletter. Well, they trust you. And if you value that trust and you don't spam them in the email, then they will, you know, probably buy your book. They will advocate for your book. They will help you grow your audience. They will recommend you to others. Um, there's more fascinating evidence from the research that Peter Hildick Smith did that the power of brand, so we're going to go there next, but social proof is the first step um, in building a brand. But once you get to the point that people recognize your brand, 
the purchase decision once they know you and if they've bought one is 15 times increase um, in their um, the, their decision to buy your book again. So if you can get that first purchase and even that first connection and then uh, start to have a long-term relationship with this person, uh, it will pay off over time. And so be authentic. Be relevant to the audience you want to sell to ultimately and market to and talk to. Be relevant to them, uh, which means understanding who they are and what they care about. Be memorable, which means, you know what, all those quirky things, if you're a spelunker or you're a um, mountain climber or you're a scuba diver, whatever you are, be, be, be a personal a person, you know, be memorable, be who you are, and be present. That is the commitment that you make. Uh, that's one of the reasons that the calendar is great, because it, it, it uh, causes you to actually do something on social media on a regular basis. That's the only way that social media pays off is by being present on a consistent basis. You cannot tweet or post once a month and expect to grow an audience. Connect other people with each other. Um, connect them with great information that they think would be relevant. Connect them to your stories of creation and writing your book, your frustrations, your highs, your lows, your human journey, your creative journey, and then connect the dots by, like we said, making sure when they discover you in one setting, they have the ability to go to the setting where they, li they most like to uh, hang out and learn more about you. Yeah, uh, Bruce, Harrell, Bruce Harrell has a comment. He says, people are much more likely to purchase an item from someone they're familiar with than someone they don't know. It's basic salesmanship. We talked this morning about, um, about the concept of um, atomizing your book uh, to help to create this content for social media, whether you take a character, a character sketch or a deleted chapter or an extra recipe or pictures of, uh, of inspirations for the setting. Um, but we also talked about, um, uh, uh, not, not, it's not so important what I had for breakfast as an author, but certainly this, as you said, this human journey that I'm going on, uh, where I found the inspiration, how, what my progress is looking like, uh, can I get feedback uh, from my potential uh, audience on which book cover seems to be the best. I think those things are attractive as well. Oh, yeah. The, the readers love to have a stake in in your journey. Um, it's, you know, really how uh, they become those super fans. Um, at, at Bublish, we, the, the power of that story, we just say, tell, you know, tell us where, what inspired the same scene. And your uh, book bubbles are the way that um, our authors can share their brand stories. But, you know, what inspired the scene? Um, what inspired the character? We even have a tool that enables authors to share these stories right from their manuscripts. And I think this morning I told you about the one author who was saying, do you believe the character in this excerpt that I'm sharing from my manuscript would really fall for this guy who's much wimpier than her? And, uh, you know, so she just started a conversation around that. Um, and, you know, this is, this is an author who through engagement, now, I think she now has like 80,000 Twitter followers. So she And she comes out of a PR background. And uh, she really understands the value of drawing people in, vesting them in the story. Um, and they love that. Uh, you know, throughout all of eternity, I think uh, readers have always loved to hear the backstory that authors have. Uh, in creating mm -hmm. their characters, you know, it's fun. So yeah, this this slide is really about you know as social proof, you know, you get that interest and and how do you take that and start to turn it into a brand? Um, so when you grab someone's interest and you start to think about that value proposition of what is your you know what is your book really about? What makes it different? Um, there's so much uh, price discounting that you know, that is, and that can be a powerful discovery tool, but it's really a lot about time as well. So what's going to make me, I really like your genre, but what's going to make me 
um, connect with your book in particular. And this is the way you start to to define a unique identity that, that really goes deeper than that concept of just a platform of people looking at you. But who are you as a writer? What is your voice? If you wrote in three genres, what is it about those books that would connect them? Um, there's something about how you write. There's something about why you write. There's something about the characters you write that you need to really think about. And that's where you, you go to, to build that identity. Um, the next thing that you've done in the social proof phase is build the trust. And that what you do with the trust that the readers give you is build a reputation. So, yeah, I follow, signed up for the newsletter, and now all I get is, you know, buy my books for sale for sale. So your reputation becomes what you do with the reader's trust. Do you do you value it? Are you grateful for it? Do you genuinely um, want to have a, an ongoing relationship with these with these readers? They will know it. You know, do you do you surprise them and delight them with uh, those outtakes from your book or perhaps a short story that no one else can see because they're there supporting you. How are you supporting them? And that will build your reputation. And primarily, higher than anything, is the quality of the books that you deliver to your readership and, and, and you know, providing them with a great, entertaining read that, that you promise them. And for community, that community is, again, give and take. Um, they will become your brand advocates if you if you handle that trust um, and build a strong relationship, they will go out and advocate for that unique identity that is you and your books. And that unique identity should really be a personal author brand. Um, yes, books and series have identities of their own, but um, the, the data is overwhelming that we buy for author brands that we like, and that's the unique identity part. Um, and I just love this quote because I think in, a, in one little kernel it kind of nails down what a brand is. And, and brands are, you know, if you're not in this business of building them and you don't do a lot of marketing, it's hard to understand. But your brand is, is, is your promise to your audience. Um, it tells them what they can expect from you and your work, and it differentiates what you offer from that of your competitors. Your brand stems from who you are, how you want to be known, and who people perceive you to be. So uh, I love that. Your brand is your promise. That's a great way to think of it. Um, what do you promise readers? Uh, you know, a thriller that keeps them on the edge of their seats, um, uh, uh, beautiful sentences that they'll never forget, scenes from, you know, or history. What is it that you're promising your readers and how do you deliver on that? And it's something you should really, when you get up in the morning, say to yourself, you know, what have I promised readers and how am I going to deliver on that today? And part of that is even access to you. Um, and just, you know, as a uh, kind of a last thing I'm building, you know, brand building tips and best practices, again, just to emphasize, um, like entrepreneurs who create products, your book is a product. Uh, we don't like to think of our books that way because we're creative people, but, you know, in essence, someone is, is buying your book and it is a product that they take and it has this promise wrapped around it and if you don't deliver in those pages, no amount of social marketing is, is going to overcome that. It needs to be well written, edited, formatted, designed to please the audience um, that you've researched and that you're writing for. Um, the next thing is to think about the fact that all types of media are part of your brand. This is a um, strategic marketing. So you may be ready to write your first book and you're thinking about your first cover. Do not think about that cover in isolation unless you only plan to write one book in your life. Because those visual elements, even the, the smallest things like the font that you choose to write your name in on the front cover, if those 
are the same over time, that visual cue builds uh, a memorable part of your brand, your color palette you choose for your books. Um, so don't rush in to any media decisions. Um, you know, even the color palette of your website, it, it, we, it should match the color palette of your books, should also resonate with the types of readers. You know, you wouldn't want pink and green in a horror, you know, those types of things. Um, figure out why you write. Ask yourself the hard questions. Um, what is your promise, your unique promise to your readers? And what differentiates your work? Um, and how are you going to articulate that unique promise that you are making to readers that no one else can make? Um, and that takes, you know, stopping the wheels from turning and uh, you're not learning Facebook or Twitter, but if you stop and do that work, when you do engage, you will say things authentically in a well thought out way that will then make that a very effective marketing tool for you, uh, the different social media outlets. And then measure um, the things um, that you do to find out what's working. I do uh, say one thing that everyone should do is, is tie their website to Google Analytics. Um, look uh, Hootsuite um, will give you analytics. Um, MailChimp gives you analytics. We have uh, metrics at Publish to show people what's resonating because if you can start to look at data rather than just, eh, I think that's working, yeah, yeah, let's see, I'll try this, yeah, I think that's working. I mean, your time is uh, precious, so do things that are effective and look at the numbers. Um, that's something entrepreneurs need to learn because that's how marketing really works. And if you're going to run a successful business, uh, you need to look at the numbers. So look for measurement tools that can mm -hmm. help mm -hmm. you become more effective. Uh, Bruce, Bruce has got a question for us. He says, uh, how do you feel about positioning statements? And, of course, I, the, the one that pops to, to my mind is uh, the one we used to use in graduate school marketing, which was, uh, you know, I write X for target market a Y, and unlike uh, competitor Z, uh, my book does this, 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 and this, or something similar to that uh, as a guide for building my brand. Uh, Kathy, do you have any nifty little positioning statement Mad Libs that, uh, that you use or recommend? Well, I don't know about positioning, uh, but one thing that we did with our company, I think this is a great thing for um, Re, for writers to do is call their their reader profiles. So for us, they would be target consumer profiles would be used in other industries. But so sit down and again, it's always great instead of you know I I like the positioning papers, but the reader profile forces you into the reader mindset. So you sit down and you've gathered your information about a reader, and so you you might find three different personas. Um, that you, you're either coming in contact with them on social media or you're, um, you've met them at a conference or you have seen some data about them and you literally create these personas of, of readers that might write, re read your book and then you say to yourself, hmm, how would I engage and delight that particular writer? Um, and where can I find them, and how can I talk to them and learn more about them? And you go through the personas. So I think that's a really interesting exercise um, for authors to do, put themselves mm -hmm. in the, the persona mindsets. Now, uh, Anne's got a question for us, uh, and I'm a little bit familiar with her case. She, her, her basic question is, um, should I build in my brand around my personal, real-life name, or if I write exclusively under a pen name, should I build my brand name uh, around my pen name? That's a difficult one, Bill. I think you probably... So we, on Bublish, we always encourage people to have photos and use their real name, and then we get the occasional email <laughs> that I'm, uh, you know, I am a school teacher, so mm -hmm. I write 
romantic fiction that's not appropriate for my parents. So it, it is a case-by-case -case, um, approach. I think we live in uh, an age of transparency. If, if you've already, I, I've actually seen authors a flip from pen names, uh, so they wrote in in other genres, um, they use their real name some places, they use pen names in other genres just because of different thinking in different decades and then watch them bring all of that under their real name because we do live in the age of transparency. It's very hard to create, you're kind of creating a fake persona uh, and pull mm -hmm. that off. It does still happen. Um, but without knowing your circumstances, it's hard for me to advise because I do believe there are times when it is appropriate. But if you have a choice, I think um, you want to build an author brand that is uh, authentically you. It just it's a lot of to do, but I'd have to know more. Yeah. About. And you're welcome yeah, to it's, email it's... me and tell me your personal situation um, if if that's you know something you want more detail on. I'm happy to to try to think through your particular situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a question this morning, as a matter of fact, from uh, one of the attendees who emailed me afterwards, and, and she reminded me that uh, she writes in uh, four or five different genres. And her, her purpose for having her various pen names was not uh, necessarily a, uh, to shield um, uh, attribution from real life, you know, the, the teacher example, but her reason for having the pen names was much more along the lines of, well, people who read my crime books, uh, I'm, I'm worried that they'll also know that I write romance and they won't take me seriously, or people that read my romance books, once they learn I write crime thrillers, uh, you know, won't, won't be as big of fans, and so I would, I would say that in that case, it's probably okay to start uh, owning the attribution of the pen names. Um, I think they're a great way to, to to telegraph that you're now reading something from me as an author in a specific genre, um, but of course, as you said, there's it's, it's sort of everybody has their own case, and it's hard to uh, it's hard to, to give a good blanket. Um, yeah, and my piece of advice. My, my my question there is, you know, you basically are, you know, in a in a marketplace like the one that we're all working in now, like uh, boy the power of knowing that you could maybe uh, generate interest in one of your other genres just because you really knew how to describe what it was that was uniquely your voice across all these genres. I, I think it's a missed opportunity, but, you know, um, I understand where it came from and I know the history there, but, but my advice now is is build one really strong name and there's so many authors writing in numerous genres now I don't think that we are constrained the way we used to be when everything happened in shelves so and, sure. and there's all kinds of there's even you know with uh, the ISBN I'm I think I'm I think it's called an ISSN there's a new number out um, I remember Laura Dawson of Bowker talking about that even links, you know, if you're a screenwriter or a musician that just links again all of your creative endeavors um, toward, so that there's discoverability across those different media. Um, so to me, I, I, I think that's the future is discovery in one place. Gosh, I love how this person writes or I love their music and it it's a way to, to enter into their world of creativity and try some other medium or genre that they write in. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we've got uh, one last question that I want to, I, I, Kathy, I want you to tell us a little bit about Publish. I know that uh, the tool and what you are doing is very cool and um, addresses uh, many of the needs that we've outlined tonight. Um, but let's take this one quick uh, question from uh, Yehuda. Uh, is fantasy mythology, is fantasy mythology a genre? And I would say that uh, at the very least, it's a genre mashup. And the best thing to do is to find books like the one you think you're writing, or like the one you are writing. 
uh, the, the books that you think are like it. And uh, find out where in the Amazon store and where in the Barnes & Noble store, the online bookstores, those books are shelved, if you will, uh, because Amazon uses a slightly different uh, genre tree than Barnes & Noble does. And once mm -hmm. you've figured out where your neighbors, so to speak, are located, you heard it, you, uh, you should get a good feel for where your book might, be, might fit appropriately. Kathy, tell us a little bit about Publish. So Publish is a powerful suite of marketing tools um, designed really to help today's author be successful with social marketing and brand building. Um, we are uh, automating a lot of this by creating um, a tool called the Book Bubble where you take your excerpts, which are your best writing, and then you tell the story behind the story. That's Again, your brand story, your story of creation, whatever you want to share, they're very easy to create. And every book bubble um, travels with a lot of metadata, so it's read by the search engines. It also travels with a photograph of you, a photograph of your um, book and your synopsis, a link to your website, a, a link to your bio. And this summer we introduced the Authorpreneur dashboard so that we have a free version of the platform and then we have a subscription-based one and you can actually write your book and start sharing excerpts as you write with rough cut book bubbles and also track metrics to see where people are viewing um, your book bubbles and reading your content. Um, and also a lot of uh, marketing help and exclusive content to help uh, authors become better marketers. So, you know, I, I started this because I saw, um, I worked for Forbes and I had my kids at home and um, then I came back to writing and I looked at what had happened to that particular brand, which is one of the most well-known in the world. It's an editorial brand, which means it is powered by the people that create the Forbes name, but when they moved out of physical into the digital space, there was kind of a fracturing of the brand and the content, and boy, for journalism, that just was um, the death knell. I mean, they, they are now um, primarily owned by, no great irony here, um, a Chinese conglomerate, um, but, you know, and it's the biggest name in capitalism, Forbes, you know, as far as an editorial brand goes. So in creating the book bubble, it was trying to recreate the bookstore browsing experience for readers online, but for authors to make sure that their brand and their brand message was very close to their content and could not be pulled apart as they shared samples and shared stories. And, and sampling is a really very powerful form of social proof yeah. as well. So it was a way to break your book up into a million different samples. But thanks Perfect. for that. Yeah, so you can sign up yeah. for a free account if you'd like. Sounds, sounds great. Kathy, thank you so much for joining us. This was a great session, uh, just as great as this morning's, I think. And I really appreciate all of, the, of your wisdom. And we've got, I think there's some, clearly some great actionable, actionable items in here. I hope everybody enjoyed the presentation tonight. Uh, as I said before, in about uh, 24 hours or less, you should receive a follow-up email with a link if you'd like to review it. Send Kathy or me an email, and we'll be happy to send you the slides. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bill. Have a great evening. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks for having me, Bill. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your great questions. Have a good night. Thanks. Bye-bye.